Well, we've got Amy Brown, Sarah Klein, and Carrie Holt with us this morning. They've written the book, The Other Side of a Special, Navigating the Messy, Emotional, Joy-Filled Life of a Special Needs Mom. And I've also invited my wife, Becky Kankelfritz, to join us this morning because uh, we have a daughter diagnosed with multiple disabilities as well. Why don't you guys talk about your, your families and uh, help us get to know your kids? Sure. First of all, thank you so much for having us. Um, I'm Amy Brown, and um, I've been married to my high school sweetheart for 37 years. Um, we live in Michigan, and we are parents to six children. Our oldest three are biological, and then we entered into adopting, and our youngest three are um, adopted. And that's what brought us into the special needs world. We did not know uh, when we adopted that our children would have special needs. Um, our children have um, invisible spe special needs. They are they have fetal alcohol syndrome, um, attachment disorder, and kind of those invisible disabilities that have a lot of behavioral things that come from when you adopt kids that come from trauma. Can you describe have, what those invisible disabilities yeah. are? Right. Well, first of all, a lot of those invisible disabilities, for example, fetal alcohol syndrome is when a child is exposed to alcohol um, when the mom is pregnant. So that really affects executive functioning and um, behavior. Um, it's not something you can see, so it's not something you may realize that's, that your child has until you start having some pretty negative behavior. A lot of times they will steal or do something and then not remember they did it. So consequences in explaining things don't always work. Another issue of kids that come from trauma is because they came from trauma, they didn't have a safe adult to attach to. So they have what's called attachment disorder. And kids with attachment disorder um, can be violent and um, act out in a lot of different ways because they don't think the world is safe. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about kids with attachment disorder is we have this narrative that I'm going to adopt them and love them but the, the nurturing caregiver, the mom, they don't feel safe with because they didn't have anyone else to feel safe with. So a lot of behavior in people that have kids with attachment disorders, there's a lot of behavior against the mom. Um, they won't, I, I tell the story that my daughter was three years old or four years old and she had an MRI for a seizure and the nurse said, pick her up and hold her like she likes to be held. And I stood there and thought, I don't know how she likes to be held. And I felt like a really bad mom in that moment. What I didn't understand is she didn't like to be held. She pushes you, she pushed us away. Um, because she didn't feel safe. Um, and on top of that, we also have a, a child that we adopted at age 10 from an orphanage in Bulgaria, and he had 10 whole years of no parents. Mm. And also, he has physical disabilities. He's deaf and has um, something called arthrogryposis. But those disabilities have been, you can see them, and we get a lot of support, but the behavioral disabilities, not so much, because he lived in a pretty violent place for 10 years. Um, so that's kind of where I come from, talking about kids that may look typical, but have these needs that other people may not realize they have. And as a parent, you don't, you're thinking, what in the world? What am I doing wrong? Am I not parenting right? Like, there's just not been a lot of information for adoptive and foster parents. I hope that's, I think that's getting better. But I, I just thought, man, I really dropped the parenting ball here. Mm. Even though I had three Aww. other kids that I was parenting, um, so that's that's where we are, and we live. And to add all that, we live in Michigan. So I can't imagine your own child not wanting you to hold them. Yeah, that that yeah. breaks my heart. It's it's really um, heartbreaking, and there's a lot of shame in it because you think, <laughs> what am, what's wrong with me? Yeah. Even though you just because we are told love's going to take care of it. And love does a lot of things. I'm not saying, oh, but these kids have so much trauma that to think we're just going to give them a food and a home and lots of loving, if they don't let you love them, I, I know I think Sarah's told me before when I've gone, they don't love me, she'll say, it's like your gas tank. If I, I can put the gas tank till it's full, but if the tank's full, the gas is going to fall out, right? So so sometimes me trying harder is, is the act, this is what I did initially, is the mm. absolute wrong thing to do because they can't accept it yet. And that is, it's, it's, it can be shame-filled, definitely. Wow. Okay. So I have four kids, and they are not ages 19 to 13. And my 16-year-old was 
prenatally diagnosed with spina bifida and hydrocephalus. And when he went into the hospital the day he was born, had two initial surgeries, and then we took him home after eight days. And then he went to respiratory failure when he was two and a half weeks old. Oh, goodness. So then we spent two months in the hospital, a month in the ICU where he was fighting for his life. And after that hospital stay, we brought home a medically fragile baby with a trach ventilator feeding tube, full-time nursing in our home. Mm -hmm. He's a full-time wheelchair user now. And over the last 16 years, he's had 61 surgeries. So we've been in and out of the hospital quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And he also has developmental delays, learning disabilities. Some of the initial things he had in the beginning, he was able to overcome. He doesn't have a feeding tube anymore. Even with a trach, he can talk, but he's still dependent on his ventilator when he sleeps. So that's a little bit about our journey. Real rough beginning, still not easy. Mm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, okay. How about you, Sarah? My, I've been married to my husband for 25 years. We are also high school sweethearts. And um, mm -hmm. I have a 22 year old and he is actually in college studying to be a missionary. And my youngest is our child with special needs. His name is TJ. He is, he just turned 19 and he has, um, a progressive aggressive form of muscular dystrophy that is terminal it's called duchenne muscular dystrophy and he was diagnosed at the age of eight we put him in i worked for an orthopedist at the time and he just wasn't walking upstairs correctly and since we worked for an orthopedist we we got a quick referral into a pediatric uh, physical therapist and they he, he got better very quickly. And then we just noticed he took a turn for the worst. And so we put him back in and um, they noticed that he had very large calves, very defined calf muscles. And so we, he also, we had put him in kind of, cause we noticed that he had some other issues with um, dyslexia and he was on the spectrum. And one specific doctor that was a friend of the doctor that I worked with kind of started putting two and two together. He had just read a paper on Duchenne and I actually fielded a phone call. Um, our receptionist st st stepped away from the phones. And so I fielded a phone call from a, the pediatric uh, physical therapist and said, well, I have a concerned with a patient that you referred over. And I asked for the patient's name and he gave my son's name. And I said, well, I'm his mother. And he said, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you. And that's kind of how it started. So I called the doctor who was off that day. And he said, well, my friend actually had the same, so don't panic, but we think it could be. And he said, Duchenne, of course, I'd never heard of it before. I didn't know how to spell it. So I'm like, okay, muscular dystrophy. What was, what was the guy with the telethon? <laughs> I just, because I yeah. remember there being a telethon. Right. <laughs> so I was like, oh, that's right. MDA. So I started like, uh, that's where we started. And, um, I, they said, don't panic. Cause it very well could not be that. And what I just remember looking online and, they had this video of this boy that was called a Gower's maneuver. And it was how he stood up off the, this child, how he stood up off the floor. And I remember thinking that's my son. Mm. And I also remember thinking they're usually in a wheelchair by the age of 12, they have an average life expectancy of 23. And I just remember thinking by that time, the receptionist had come back with lunch and we were the only two in the building because it was uh, New Year's Eve that, and so everybody else had left and she came back and she was like, what are you looking at? And I said, I just filled this phone call. And I, so I told her about it and I said, oh my gosh, 23 years old, that's a life expectancy. And I just remember thinking, I remember saying out loud, that's not enough time. And so I had to tell my husband, I just remember that was the hardest phone call. So he's actually doing really well. He is probably one of the happiest, absolutely the strongest person I know. Uh, 
deteriorating muscles or not. So he mm -hmm. just, he just has an absolute zest for life that mm. it, it is amazing how somebody who has this type of diagnosis can show you that there's so much more to life than uh, the longevity of it. I, I would think that's inspiring. Um, and I don't know if you knew this, one of our artists, Toby Mack, I'm pretty sure he has a son diagnosed with, oh, you know, you know, you know that. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. Uh, he, he and I have had some conversations about that and what that's, you know, when they got that diagnosis, what that was like and everything. And I, I'm just curious from your standpoint, what is it like knowing that short life expectancy and how has that affected you? Mm. I was I was in a fog for a long time and I actually was very angry at God for a long time. I, w I was brought up Christian and you would think that that would have cemented it for me. It didn't. Um, I kind of have, um, I've talked about it before. I had what I, I call my quintessential Christian temper tantrum and I just was so angry. My husband didn't become a Christian until he was 26 and he was just like, God's got this, We're, we'll be fine. I did not have that reaction. It was, it was pretty opposite. But I remember my son was really taking, both of my sons were taking their cues from me. And I remember thinking, the average life expectancy is 23, but we started the families we were meeting, there were sons that were passing away and a few girls, but mostly, son, mostly boys. They were nine years old and some of them were 28. Some of them were six years old. Some of them were 18. It's there's There was such a wide variety. And so I was looking at my son and I was thinking, it could be a year from now. It could be 15 years from now. And all I could think of was it's a terminal diagnosis, but I was quickly turning it into a terminal life for him. And wow. he was taking his cues from me. Oh, and I, and I thought, Whatever time we have left, I could sit here and pout about it and I could make it the worst life that he has, mm -hmm. or we could just take it for what it's worth. And my husband and I kind of, you, you learn to have kind of a weird sense of humor with it. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> we'll, we'll look, we're like, well, if we get to get out of anything, we get to get out of doing the dishes tonight. So we'll, we'll take that opportunity. <laughs> and we're like, we don't get, we don't have to do the dishes tonight. We get to take this opportunity to go to the movies. And so we, we kind of joke Aww. around about it and do that kind of thing with him. And it's like, mm. if he said one time, do you think I'll be able to walk on the beach again? And my mm. husband, I, I call my husband, we were actually at doctor's appointments. We flew out East every 28 days for three years, my, my son and I, and I called my husband and told him, I said, do you know what he asked me today? And he said, I'll start planning a trip. And that's what we did. He mm. wanted to know if he'd ever be able to walk on the beach again. Oh. And I think in that respect, we're lucky because a lot of families would be, well, that's a silly question. What I don't think most children would ask that question first of all. So we get to take opportunities to take that time out of life that a lot of families wouldn't mm -hmm. take. So, you know, you touched on something angry at God. Mm -hmm. I think we've all been there. Mm -hmm. How have you dealt with it? <laughs> well, I can't look at Carrie while I say this. <laughs> Carrie cries a lot. <laughs> Okay, Carrie, you can cry. That's okay. <laughs> well, she makes she makes me cry. Um, anger was something. It's something that I talk about a lot, and it didn't wasn't something that I talked. I started really talking about the details of my anger until recently, because um, it was a very shame filled story for me. But I I said certain things about God that I think we skim over the details of our anger with God. We just like, oh, we were really angry at God, and I. I cried out to God, or we say very churchy, I call them, you know, quote unquote, churchy phrases. And we don't get into the nitty gritty of it. But I use certain phrases like I remember looking at my husband, I'm like, he is a puppet master, and we are here for his enjoyment. And I remember saying that phrase, and that is mm. a really hard thing for me to say out loud without breaking down. Um, and I, I remember thinking, and I just recently, Amy had shared a story that I thought was really brave of her to say. So I started, I started thinking, I can't share that. I cannot share that story. I cannot share that and say 
out loud that I said that about God. How can I say that and not feel that shame of saying that? And I remember, I just felt like God was saying, but that's not a shame story. You're not sharing your shame story. You're sharing your redemption story. And (laughs) so that's what I think we all have those moments where maybe not all of us, I'm not saying all of us, but for me, I did. I had those moments where I was literally in my closet crying, Mm. or I had to go into the shower, turn it on behind three closed doors and really have that breakdown moment and almost walk away from my faith because I was that angry and have that moment where I decided, is my faith really what I believe in or am I going to walk away from it? And I said some really horrible things to God and I said some really things horrible things about him. And he never once walked away from me. He just, I felt him saying, I know what it's like to lose a child Mm. and we're going to walk through it together. Mm. But it wasn't a shame story. It was a redemption story. And so that's why I feel like I can share it, but I break down almost every time I share it. (laughs) Mm. How about uh, Carrie and Amy? You've been there, I'm sure. Yeah, I honestly think it's taken me a little while to admit that I was that I have been angry at God. And I actually feel like it's something I'm still working through because part of my story is that I read a book about my son has hydrocephalus and he has something. He has a malformation in his brain called a Chiari 2 malformation. And so I'm a teacher and I'm a type A planner. So I wanted to learn everything I possibly could before he was born. So I'm reading this book and it's listing all these things related to a Chiari crisis, like uh, failure to thrive and aspiration and your airway not being stable and possibly needing a trach. And I remember praying that every single thing on that list wouldn't happen because ironically, we have really close friends of ours that has a son the same age as our oldest son with a trach ventilator and a feeding tube. So he was about four years old at this time. And I knew what that life looked like. And I knew I didn't want to live it. And so I'm praying all these specific things. God, please don't let this happen. You know, I don't want to have to have this. And literally every single thing on that list happened. Mm. And, you know, in the moment we were just in survival and honestly, we were in survival for about 15 years. My son had his last major surgery in May of uh, 2021 and he had a spinal fusion and the last year and a half to two years, I feel like it's finally settling in everything that has happened. And I'm finally realizing like, wait, God, you didn't answer my prayers. In fact, just recently we're learning just the ongoing nature of some of this, uh, some of the effects of this Chiari crisis. And he'll probably have a trait his whole life and he'll probably be on a ventilator his whole life. And I feel like I'm now going, but Lord, I'm a rule follower and I followed all the rules Mm. and I didn't walk Mm -hmm. away from my faith. And yet you still said, no, why did you say no? Um, and so I think it's been hard for me to admit, uh, that I've been angry and, and that it's hard. Um, and I'm just learning to live in that tension of lament and crying out to him and saying, this is, this really, this really stinks. And it's really hard because we don't know what the future looks like. And we don't know if our son will be able to live on his own and be independent and all those types of things. Um, But I think I'm finally at the place where I'm learning that it's okay to live in that tension of this didn't turn out the way that I wanted it to. I can lament it and grieve it, but I can also have gratitude and it's just kind of like understanding that all those emotions can be going on all at the same time and that's okay Mm -hmm. there doesn't have to be a solution to it and i don't it doesn't have to be fixed Mm. becky do you want to chime in on that because i (laughs) i feel like you're there in that a lot too the 
the thing I keep thinking about is when Sally invited me to come onto the podcast with you guys, I told Michael, I said, I, I don't talk about this stuff with anybody. <laughs> so Thanks. I don't know that I could, I could add anything to the podcast. I've never, I know, I never talk about this stuff. So when you guys are saying that you're learning to talk about it, it's, I understand that because it's not some, I know for me, I feel like people don't want to hear about it. You know, it, it's not positive. <laughs> it, you know, people, <laughs> people don't want to hear about it. They want to hear, I feel like with Abby, Abby's such a happy little girl. Well, she's not a little girl anymore. She's 20, but um, she's such a happy girl. And I feel like that's what people want to see the happy Abby and, you know, and how she's smiling and laughing. And so that's our, that's our story, but it's, it's much harder than that. You know, oh, there was been, a lot you've of been at odds with God on this. Oh, I don't know how many times, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, you know, like, yeah, I mean, and I grew up in a, um, I grew up in the charismatic word of faith, um, tradition of Christianity where you believe in healing and, you know, it's going to happen and, uh, it hasn't happened and it, you know, and, um, and we took her to like every kind of healing service we, you could think of, you know, we, we took her everywhere yeah. to every prayer meeting to everything, you know, yeah. and cause that's how I grew up. And, you know, there, that was, that was really hard to mm -hmm. um, grow up in that tradition and then have it, it, nothing change. And, you know, and it's 20 years and nothing's changed. So, uh, you learn to, uh, to deal with that and deal with how you were taught and how um, that works with what you're dealing with in your life. And uh, it has not been easy, but um, I do feel like we have grown a lot, which is good. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel like I'm a, I always say I'm a much better mother to Abby now than when, she, when we were getting all of di the diagnoses and, you know, I'm able to accept everything that is and be happy in it, you know, even though it's hard sometimes. Yeah. Amy, you mm -hmm. kind of started out saying you were, angry. you were kind of angry with God with all the, with what you found out too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because we chose adoption yeah. <laughs> and I remember, um, when you, when you adopt, you like say, I don't want to take this. You like, you do this checklist, which sounds kind of cool, but it's kind of like, what can your family handle? Of course I didn't want to be a special needs mom. And, but I, but I was like, okay, we'll take an HIV child. I, Cause my husband and I are both medical. So I thought we could do that. But the one thing I said no to, because I remembered it was fetal alcohol syndrome. I said, Nope, don't want that. I remember reading about it in nursing school. And then the birth mom, they didn't know she was going to have fetal. They, the birth moms don't always, you know, realize or whatever that they've abused. So I was really mad and you guys you social needs moms can understand that people look at us like mother Teresa, like you're so patient you're so this and you're so that so when you're hearing those messages it's hard to say but i'm mad <laughs> and i remember somebody saying to me i just can't wait to see what god's gonna do and and i remember laying in my bed and thinking what have you done do you mm -hmm. literally like i've said things to god like do you hate me like what's going on here <laughs> and as a good girl i, f I feel terrible saying that mm -hmm. um but I will say that he, even in the hard and even in the times I've been at the psych ward and the times I've had to deal with hard things like your kid being expelled or behavior issues or what all the things that aren't warm, fuzzy things when you're getting a call from the principal that this thing is in your child's acting out again. <laughs> or every kid in the class has had their parent teacher conference about your kid. That's oh, happened to me. <laughs> wow. Like that's and you're just like, oh, they don't know they don't know me. But I just in those moments I just feel like I have to believe that he is a God who sees me and he <laughs> is walking with me. And I wish that I could claim healing and promises and good results. But what I want to claim and stand in is who what who he is, is in his character. Mm -hmm. He does not leave us and he walks with us in every step. And, and even in the lowest moments when I've been mad, when I've cried my eyes out, I have never felt like he's not been with me. And that kind of gives me the the grace to go, okay, I can do this another day. <laughs> but 
I th- you're right. Nobody wants to hear those emotions. And I think that's why a lot of special needs moms feel very isolated. <laughs> you either feel like if you start talking, you'll never stop and you'll be the train wreck at every dinner, at every coffee chat, or, <laughs> or you just can't open up. And I think that's one of the reasons that the three of us wanted to write this book is like, you're not alone in any of these emotions. And we're not going to get you to a tidy package at the end. Like, you'll never feel angry again, but we just want you to know <laughs> we feel these things mm. and it's okay to feel these things and you're you're not alone and you are seen by God in each one of these emotions. Well, I feel like That's we've started so a little beautiful. support group this morning. That's really good. I know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. And you know, um, in the five years that I've gotten to know Becky and Tank, um, wow, there's been so many times I thought, what can I do? What can I do as a friend? And um, so I want to just kind of throw that question out to all all four of you. You know, how can we be a good friend to you? How can we Mm -hmm. um, reach out and help make a difference with this this load? I mean, all of us, even with children who don't have special needs, sometimes we feel like we (laughs) we need a little hand up. So I can only just imagine. And so I just want to open the floor and and have you share with us just some practical wisdom I mean, there's medical needs, there's the in, in, invisible and the visible disabilities, there's, you know, you, everything represented here from adoption to uh, um, the whole gamut. So how can, how can we be better friends to you all? I, I think one of the things is to just keep pushing back when we say we're fine. Mm. Um, <laughs> I have a story when we were first diagnosed, we had our elders and my husband's on the leadership team at church and they wanted to know about the diagnosis because nobody really knew what it was. And we kind of didn't know what it was too. So we tried to give the best explanation and, um, they asked what we needed. And we, we said at that time that over, it was close to 90% of marriages and this particular diagnosis ended in divorce at that point. And so we said, that was a concern of ours. Can you pray over our marriage? That was specific for us at that time. And we had one, we have one specific gentleman, even 11 years later that he will come up to me. And I, he had asked me, what can I do specifically for you? And I said, don't take fine for an answer. And, mm. um, cause I will always say fine. I don't. And so he will put his hands on my shoulder and he will get eye level. He's like, how are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm doing good. No how are you doing? And so he waits for me to say something and he always wants a, he wants an honest answer. And so he will wait for me to give him a legitimate answer. And it, sometimes it's, well, this medication is being turned down again and this, and and so then he'll follow up the next, the next week. And he doesn't want a tidy answer. Our lives Mm -hmm. make people very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, and especially, you know, for you're, people. I'm just going to butt in and say you're right. <laughs> and that, that's why it's hard to speak up about mm-hmm. it. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, too, and you guys could probably attest to this, you know, especially if your children are around our age, um, our children's age, because yes. people will see that and they're like, oh, that hits a little too close to home. I they're don't. not cute anymore. No, yes. no, no. Yeah. it's right. It, it was all fine and good when my son was that tow headed little boy in the wheelchair. Now he's 19. They're not cute. Mm-hmm. That cute That's anymore. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now people and, are going to listen to that and go, wait a second. Well, right. wait, get the heart of what we're saying here. Right, right. It's, it's a real yeah. thing that, that we yeah. deal with, though, because you don't have yeah. those cute little toddler pictures anymore, you know. Right, mm-hmm. right. And I think it's it's a never ending burden that we're afraid that we're handing out. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we just, we don't want to always, I think Amy, you always said that you just know you're always, or maybe it's Carrie, I forget which one you're like, you just know you're always on the the food list at church. You're always going to be like, Oh, here come, here come the Browns again. What do they need now? So, yeah. Another casserole, obviously. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anybody else want to chime in there? I think for me, it is teaching your kids to see kids like ours, all of ours, for the people that they are Mm. and not the disability that they are. I feel like it's really hard for my son to have good friends because he's in this weird, like, 
he's verbal and he, in some ways he's age appropriate for 16, but then some ways he's got a little bit of delays or he's also one of those kids going through teenage years who will just say whatever comes into his head. He's very, uh, very black and white and he'll just, he'll just say things. And so we have just a very few people in our lives who are willing to say, Hey, can so-and-so come over and just hang out with Toby? Like he wants to come over and hang out with Toby and they just, you know, watch Star Wars or play video games or whatever, or to also be that friend that says, Hey, can, can you guys come over? Can we get together? And is there a way we can get your son's wheelchair in our house? Or if it's easier to come to your house, can I bring the the food? Um, Because it is so isolating. It's so isolating. And so when you have those two friends who are willing to kind of go that extra mile and and just to see our kids as the people they are with the likes and dislikes and to see past the diagnosis, I those are the special friends that we hold on to mm-hmm. dearly because we know that it's an exhausting, it's an exhausting journey for us. And we know that it's an exhausting journey for the support around us. And so when people don't walk away, that's really important too. Mm-hmm. You know, the isolation and loneliness is real. Um, yeah. Yeah. Maybe, uh, a, a, I guess, a two-pronged answer to this, and that is maybe help those that are listening to this podcast that don't have special needs kids, but then then talk to those that do have special needs kids. Uh, maybe describe why that, why do, we, why do we feel isolated? Why do we feel lonely? And then um, how can you get out of it? Mm-hmm. Well, if I can jump in here. For moms of kids that have behavioral issues, you feel lonely because your kid's behavior often, you're not, you're asked to not come to Sunday school. Mm -hmm. You're asked to not have your kid on the school trip. You're constantly feeling shame for their behavior. So of course you don't want to reach out. And uh, you know what I would say? And also, I think we get in our heads and think nobody understands what I'm going through. And one of the things that I have learned from meeting Carrie and Sarah, we have different diagnosis, but we have so much in common. So if you're looking for somebody as a special needs parent, you need somebody that gets you, yes. But that person doesn't necessarily have to have the exact same life you do. Even if you have a friend that you can just be really honest with. Um, my, I have a friend, Kathy, she's been my friends for years, and she would say to me, I didn't know how to help you because she wouldn't tell me. And so one of the ways we get out of, I know this sounds like one more thing for us to do as special needs moms, but one of the things I think we do to get out of isolation is we have to reach out for that connection with somebody and to be able to say, I need coffee without talking about my kid, or I need you to hear my every ugly thing, or can you take my child for a little bit? I know moms of kids with attachment and behavior, like they're afraid to send their kids somewhere because what if they're naughty? But for the most time, they've got cocktail party personality and they're fine with a, another person for a half a day. So I, I feel like for me, I just got in my head too much. And because I had been on the receiving end of a lot of judgment mm. that I assumed my friends would judge me. Oh, yeah. And wow. that was my mistake. Um, I had friends that loved me dearly. And when I finally opened up to what was happening in our home, they just met me with grace. Not everyone will. And that's okay. You just like, okay, that person couldn't handle what I told them. But keep looking because those people are out there that want to connect with us. And I would also go back to your other question. Have a list of things. Like I kind of have a running list of things in my head that people can do to help me for the mere fact that I'll always say, oh, I'm fine. But if I have something in the back of my head, even if it's something as simple, can you go pick up our prescriptions? That I think that's opening the door to connection with other people. Mm. I, I think too, one thing you can always do is if somebody else, if they have other children, um, if they have siblings, um, I, we have people in our church that were phenomenal about really stepping into a role with my other, my, my older mm-hmm. son, um, and really like, Hey, do you want to learn how to play guitar? Do you want to go play basketball? Do you want to go do this? Do you want to go do that? And it really took a lot of mom guilt away 
because they were pouring mm-hmm. into him whenever mm-hmm. I was flying out east every 28 days. Whenever I was gone five days out of the month with my other son, my husband could kind of get some downtime or do some things. That's another thing too. It's just, there's always so many things that you can do. And yeah, but I love that list. I think too, with Amy, I learned, I have learned so much from Amy. Amy said something one time about Carrie and I, our sons, you can see they're in a wheelchair. There's a visible disability and our, our, we need a ramp for our home people are going to come build a ramp. Mm-hmm. They're not going to come build a ramp for Amy. And so one of the things that I have learned is I always tell myself if somebody is having an outburst at, at the grocery store, or if somebody is having an issue, do I need to be a ramp for them? Oh, I always have good. that in the back. I always mm-hmm. have that in the mm-hmm. back of my head. Or if I'm at like church that. and there is a child that is being disruptive Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And somebody's like, we just, we have to do something about this child. They cannot keep coming back. Well, that's not the right answer. How are we going to be a ramp for that child? Mm-hmm. So that's always something I've had in the back. And I think that that's one of the best things that I have learned from this is everybody deserves a ramp. It's just a different right. kind. So exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Carrie, is there something you wanted to add? Well, I think you were talking about asking, you know, why is it so isolating? And I think kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier is that people want the happy story. You know, just recently there was somebody in our community, you know, where a baby was born really early. And of course, there's all these miracles happening. And I remember feeling really jealous, (laughs) actually, Mm -hmm. over this because we didn't get the miracle healing you know? And so it's like, since we don't have this happy ending, um, I think people are afraid it's going to, it's contagious, (laughs) you know, like it's going to catch, like if I'm friends with that person, then God's going to ask me to walk that road too, Mm. or it's going to happen to my grandchild or it's going to happen to my niece or nephew. And, um, so I think, I think one of the things too, is that, we, that Becky, you kind of talked about is that I think we do have to be willing to open up and share our stories and be real about, you know, it's not always right with different people. You have to find, you know, the right people to talk to. Um, But I think connection does happen when we are willing to talk about it Mm. (laughs) and to be open about it. That's good. Mm-hmm. The whole happy ending thing is pretty realistic. In fact, I've, I've told Becky she needs to write a book. She says, no, mine doesn't have a happy ending. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it kind of does, but it's not the happy ending people right. want, you know, mm-hmm. but I mean, yeah. we're happy, you know, yeah. we just, we just deal with hard things too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, let's talk about grief a little bit. When you get the diagnosis, uh, when you see what you have, people may not, that you know, typical parents may not get it, but you're you are grieving, and and it doesn't end; it continues. Maybe describe why that that happens and why it doesn't end. Well, this is kind of my forte. I talk about grief a lot because it wasn't until my son was about five years old. I went off on some librarian who go, was not girl, being to gracious <laughs> to me. Like my toddler had ruined these books and mm-hmm. my son had just gotten out of a five day hospital stay and we had to schedule yet another surgery. And all of a sudden I was in the car thinking, this isn't about library books. What is this about? And I felt like the Lord just said to me through the Holy Spirit, you're grieving and you're always going to be. Mm. You're always going to be living in that cycle. And I started to kind of dive into that and study that. And the Lord's just been teaching me so much about that in the last 10 plus years. And I think a lot of it is just because our kids aren't normal. You know, I know people say, well, what is normal? But but they're not neurotypical and they're taking a completely different path. And every milestone 
every age appropriate thing, like getting the driver's license or, you know, graduating from high school or different things that they're not happening. And so you look around at everyone else and you realize this isn't normal. And so you grieve for the losses. I think we realize the losses and I, and, but I also think it's necessary. I think it's so necessary to not sweep it under the rug. I heard someone say recently, when you sweep it under the rug, the rug is lumpy. And <laughs> I loved that. <laughs> uh -huh. mm -hmm. So I, I think it's just so important. I know I talked earlier about lament. I think it, we have to take our disappointments and losses to God and say, what do I do with this? Because mm -hmm. it hurts mm -hmm. and it's painful. Yeah. You know, there are times when, for me, it, it hits me in the evenings because uh, Becky and I have a little bit of, uh, you know, we've divided some duties a little bit. I kind of handle the afternoon and evening and she handles the morning with our daughter and, um, because partly probably because of way I've not done the right things and how I should have lifted her and things like that. I have chronic back issues and they're really severe and I need surgery. I'm a prime candidate for it, but I've neglected doing it because if you do it, you only can, you know, I can only lift 20 pounds. Then I can't help out with my daughter. And so we don't have family that lives near us. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sometimes in a lot of pain and uh, when I'm putting her in bed and that grief comes over me. The grief for me is the realization I'm going to continue to do this until I die. Um, part of it is that sounds like a strange statement because I love her. I love Abby. I love, I love who she is as well. I mean, she just makes me smile just who she is, but there's a realization that this isn't going to end. And then Becky and I talk about how, <laughs> we actually had these conversations when a relatives come to visit, you are taking care of our kids and we're going on a date because <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't have any respite where we're at right now. So um, there's that grief too. But um, yeah, it's for me, it's, it's not non, it's, it's just comes in waves every once in a while. You just smack by up. It's like, wow, here we are. And uh, this is hard, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Guys, I feel like we just scratched the surface on this, <laughs> and now we got to say goodbye. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Is there anything else you guys want to talk about or say, or anything yeah. that comes to mind that would help people? No, I think you. I think you said it. You just we just scratched the surface, and yeah. I think that's why we're doing what we're doing. I think we want everybody to know that it is just scratching the surface, and it's it's real, and it's ongoing and feelings are valid and yeah and, and just for people listening to know they're not alone right and and we know it's messy and and you know and i'm so grateful god can handle the mess of mm -hmm. all the crazy grief and anger and all of that and and then finding other people to to walk through it with you and asking God to give us those people because it's necessary. We need that connection. Mm, that's right. good. I love the back of your book kind of sums it up a little bit for me, whether we're special needs parents or love somebody who is how to find hope, joy, and community as a special needs mom. I love all of those words, hope, joy, and community. Mm -hmm. So thank you for pouring your hearts into this book, The Other Side of Special. So needed, not only for you all, but for those of us who love y'all mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, what you're going through and just relating to each other is so vitally important. So right. mm -hmm. I appreciate, you know, just the emotion and everything you went through that you had to go through to put this book together. So thank you. Yeah. Beautiful. The other side of special, uh, navigating the messy, emotional, joyful, uh, joy filled life of special needs mom. I want to say for dads, I, I read this and I was like, there's, I mean, I agree with everything in here. So it, was, it helped me too. So uh, it was, it was really good. So yeah. thank you. Our, our thank husbands you. would agree, by yeah. the way. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We're speaking for our husbands too. That's <laughs> awesome. Yes. 
Well, again, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. And uh, maybe thank we'll do you. it again. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for having us. Yeah. Thank you. God bless you on your journey. Yeah.